and welcome. And I will now turn it over to uh, our Chief Medical Officer, Dr. Janice Fitzgerald, for the update today. Thank you, Premier. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. Since our media briefing yesterday, we have one new positive case in the province. This case is within the Eastern Health Region. The public health contact tracing is ongoing and everyone considered a close contact will be advised to quarantine. <clears throat> the total number of cases in our province is 259. By region, we have 241 cases in Eastern Health, <clears throat> eight in Central Health, four in Western Health, and six in Labrador Grenfell Health Region. 53% of cases are female and 47% are male. By age, we have 22 people under the age of 20, 38 people between 20 and 39, 39 people between 40 and 49, 56 between 50 and 59, 57 between 60 and 69, and 47 who are 70 and above. Four people are in hospital due to the virus, and of these patients, one is in intensive care. 230 people have now recovered, and in total we have tested 8,552 people. Not too long ago, when COVID-19 landed in our province, we braced ourselves for the worst and hoped for the best. And at times when things were especially uncertain, we may have questioned our ability to see this through. Yet here we are today, with renewed hope as we prepare for the next phase of living with COVID-19 in Newfoundland and Labrador. It certainly has not been easy, but we have succeeded in flattening the curve of COVID-19 over the last six weeks in our province. And though the reward may seem small as we slowly but surely ease back into our lives, I am filled with pride and appreciation as we begin to see the fruits of our collective labor. While this comes with a little reprieve, we cannot yet slow our pace. The success that we have achieved to date is in large part the result of your unwavering commitment to following public health measures in place. As I mentioned during yesterday's media briefing, if we continue on our current trajectory, in a little over a week's time, we will be moving to alert level four and we'll begin the next phase of navigating COVID-19 in our province. How we proceed forward depends heavily on each of us. <clears throat> the core public health measures we have practiced so diligently to date will be just as important as ever as we move through the phases of COVID-19 in the coming weeks to months. We must continue to maintain our physical distance in public spaces. Stay home if we feel unwell cover our coughs and sneezes, and wash our hands often and well. These tried, tested, and true measures work, and by now have become second nature to many of us. As we move into the weekend and consider if and how to double our bubble, please remember this means joining with one other household or bubble only, not multiple households at a time. <clears throat> For those who work or volunteer in settings, in which close contact with others is unavoidable or work out in the public, please choose your bubble wisely to avoid putting a vulnerable person in another household at risk. Allow, <clears throat> allowing you to expand your bubble to include one other household is not meant to cause hardship or strain, but to alleviate the isolation we have all been feeling, particularly those who live alone. Many have grown quite accustomed to staying within their own bubble, and that is fine too. Remember that when you widen your bubble, you will not only be interacting with the people in the second bubble, but those that have come into contact, but those they may have come into contact as, with as well. Today, I have asked the Minister of Health and Community Services to extend the existing public health emergency order due to expire tomorrow for another 14 days. To review the details of this order, please visit gov.nl.ca slash COVID-19. These public health orders are reviewed regularly to ensure we are taking every appropriate action to reduce the impact of COVID-19 in our province and will remain in place in some capacity for the duration of this pandemic. <clears throat> I would like to acknowledge today that this is the month of Ramadan, a time of commemoration and spir spiritual growth for members of the Muslim community. While this marks a special time in the Muslim faith, I strongly encourage you to host virtual ga gatherings and dinners this year as opposed to joining in person to help protect yourselves and others from the possible exposure to COVID-19. While your traditional customs will no doubt be different this year, may your days during Ramadan be filled with peace, prayer, and reflection. 
As a recap, for those who may have just joined us, we have one new case since yesterday's media briefing. The total number of cases in the province is 259, with 241 cases in Eastern Health, eight in Central Health, four in Western Health, and six in Labrador Grenfell Health. I hope the developments this week have lifted your spirits, strengthened your determination, and allowed you to see some light at the end of the tunnel. Our ability to see this through will depend on our continued patience and dedication as we all do our part to keep each other safe. As we look ahead to what comes next, I am more confident than ever that as long as we remain strong and resolute in our efforts, we will keep COVID-19 controlled in our province. Hold fast, Newfoundland and Labrador. We're in this together. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Fitzgerald, and good afternoon, everyone, again. One more positive case of COVID-19 in our province is just a reminder of why we must remain vigilant. Yesterday, we released a document of an ill life with COVID-19 and laid out the foundation for <coughs> living with this virus in our community. So we must continue that even though we are allowed to double bubble, we must continue to follow the health guidelines. You have the option to you, but that uh, but you must do what feels right to you. It does not necessarily mean that you have to be uh, adding extra people to your bubble. Do what makes you feel safe. If you are one of the most vulnerable groups in our society, we'll encourage you to be very cautious. Now, as we head into the weekend, please keep safety top of mind and respect the health and well-being of those around you. Do not enter into someone's bubble unannounced. We appreciate how this has been a stressful time for you and your families, but also stressful on businesses and industries within our province. And that is why we've been working extremely hard to support you. Earlier today, Minister Osborne and Mr. Bruce Keating, the CEO of the Newfoundland and Labrador Liquor Corporation, well, they announced a variety of changes to support some businesses in our province as we live with, in, as we live with and navigate our way through this pandemic. So these changes were broad and they reduced some of the operating costs, they improved some working capital and access to some markets and allowed for some pickup and delivery services. It was a direct response to some of the businesses who have been experiencing difficulties. But today we also want to let you know that we've implemented solutions to help people who are deaf and hard of hearing and those who cannot communicate verbally. You are looking, if you're looking to complete the COVID-19 assessment and public health referrals, there are some extra uh, options available to you today. Newfoundland and Labrador is leading the country in creating innovative solutions to improve access to health services for the deaf and hard of hearing communities. So starting today, communication is available through a dedicated cellular text line or through a dedicated line for video relay service technology. The text line number is 709-216-8188. This is exclusively for people who are deaf and hard of hearing or those with communication disabilities that prevent them from speaking to a nurse. And the dedicated video relay service, the number is 188-834 one, two, five, two. These numbers are now live. I'd also ask you, do not use the text line if you are not deaf or hard of hearing, as this will limit the ability of the public health system to respond. Now, I know there's a lot of information, a lot of numbers here, but if you require further information, please visit the 811healthline.ca. Now, if you have to call the health line, there will be a registered nurse working in public health that will interact with the client at a testing site or in the client's home. They interact by using an iPad to connect virtually with a sign language interpreter. So there have been many great organizations in the province responsible for making this happen. So I want to say thank you. You are the voice for the deaf and hard of hearing in our communities. I want to give a big shout out to our ASL interpreters. You see them every day, Heather Crane and Sheila Keats, who have been joining us since the beginning, and they are the voice for our viewers. So I thank you for your service. 
Our work and efforts span across all pockets of our community, including working with organizations who help most with the vulnerable populations. This pandemic has negatively impacted many families and many individuals in very different ways. Although our health measures are extremely important, they often affect some of our vulnerable populations, like our seniors, individuals living with disabilities, rural and indigenous communities, single parents, people experiencing violence, the majority of whom are women. In the early days of this pandemic, I spoke about the issue of violence in our communities. And I would once again like to take a few minutes to speak about the issue of gender-based violence. First, let me say that domestic violence, partner violence, violence of any kind has no place in our society and it will not be tolerated. To those women who are struggling with violence in their lives today, please know that help is available. There are services available across the province and when you are ready and it is safe for you to reach out, there are organizations waiting to help you. We impose regulations about self-isolation and physical distancing in order for today to protect you from COVID-19. But that does not mean that you are forced to stay in a situation that is unsafe. If you're experiencing violence in your home, please reach out. All the essential services are still in place and in many cases, they have been enhanced. They've been enhanced, they have been enhanced to help you at this difficult time. There is also a list of organizations that are available to help no matter where you live in our province. They can be found if you visit our COVID-19 website. You look for them under the resources called Supports for People Who Are Experiencing Violence. If you are in immediate danger, please call 911. Our government continues to work with the many organizations who are the front lines helping women who are facing violence. The supports and the resources are there when you need them. This will not stop when COVID-19 moves on. We are committed to preventing gender-based violence through the Office for the Status of Women and our work will continue. So as we head into this weekend, continue to follow the health guidelines. Stay inside your personal bubble or your double bubble. And we want to let you know that we'll be back on our daily briefings on Monday at 2 p.m. On Saturday and Sunday, we will release our COVID-19 numbers through a news release. Now, if I could take a few seconds before I conclude my remarks. Last night, I saw many videos and posts over social media about grandparents and grandchildren reuniting. And if I could, forgive me for a moment, but I also want to give a quick shout out to a special little girl who watches this briefing every single day. I have not had an opportunity to visit her or see her since early March. And of course, what I'm talking about is my granddaughter, Antonia. And I do miss you, and we'll catch up by video this weekend and in a few days, hopefully, we will actually double our bubble. So I will now turn it over to Minister Hagee for his comments. Thank you very much, uh, Premier. And indeed, uh, um, one case today is the reminder that Dr. Fitzgerald gives us that this, uh, this issue is not past us. Um, and because of that, on her advice, I have uh, signed uh, another order uh, continuing the public health state of emergency as required under the Act. Before I get into my comments, I just will preface things with today is um, National Physicians Day, and I think it's appropriate uh, just to pause for a moment and reflect on the role that physicians have in our healthcare system, both on the front line, uh, providing hands-on care and assessment, but also in the laboratories, uh, and never more uh, than of late have we had to rely on our laboratory experts in quite the way we have. So the clinical biochemists uh, and those pathologists that we don't usually hear a lot about uh, have actually underpinned a lot of the public health efforts over the last six weeks. But to physicians everywhere, I think it is particularly appropriate just to pause for a moment uh, and consider the, uh, the, the hard work and the, uh, 
the effort that they are putting in as we go through this uh, challenging period. Uh, it's also with sadness I uh, have to mark the passing of uh, possibly the founder of modern pediatric critical care in this province, uh, Dr. Debbie Reed. Uh, she was a star. Uh, she was a, uh, a nice lady, uh, an excellent cook, and one of the best damn pediatricians you'll ever find. Uh, moving along, um, the orders, uh, the orders that you will see uh, are uh, around travel uh, and have generated a lot of discussion uh, because um, of their implementation date on May the 4th. One of our uh, main pillars of um, uh, controlling the uh, resurgence, the buildup again of cases of COVID-19 is around border control. Uh, we have processes put in place that will be ready over the weekend to deal with a lot of the questions that you have and that our MHAs and their constituency assistants have been, have been dealing with. Uh, in essence, though, if you are ordinarily a resident of Newfoundland and Labrador uh, and live here, then returning here uh, will not be an issue. If you do not normally live here, then you need to have some specific reason for coming here. Either that could be for medical or health reasons, compassionate grounds, or because you are an essential worker, essential to the critical infrastructure of this province. Documentation will be needed to support that. But essentially, if you're coming here because you have a seasonal home, your permanent address is somewhere else, or you uh, are coming here for a vacation uh, or a get-together, uh, then I'm afraid this year is not the year for you. As I say, there will be clarity around that. Uh, coming. Uh, the double bubble or the, the relaxation that Dr. Um, uh, Dr. Fitzgerald introduced yesterday has also generated some significant uh, comments and questions, and both Dr. Fitzgerald and the Premier have addressed those. But essentially, at the end of the day, it is not possible for my department or Dr. Fitzgerald to regulate or uh, arbitrate every possible scenario. The aim of the relaxation is to allow families uh, or groups of uh, households to, that would normally be in fairly close proximity to extend their protective bubble each to the other. It is not meant to encourage large family gatherings. It is not meant to permit uh, campfires uh, at cabins uh, under that excuse. We still need to look to physical distancing, and really this will be our main tool as Newfoundlanders and Labradorians right through all the alert phases uh, and stages that uh, Dr. Fitzgerald's plan has prescribed. Uh, this is no time for yard sales and things like that. We have not um, got anywhere near that kind of normalcy yet because to let our guard down now will undo all of the things that we collectively have achieved over the last six weeks. The plan as laid out yesterday with its alert levels is a stepwise plan. It is slow and it allows things to be evaluated between each step so that if there is a problem with progress, we can look to find out where that problem is or as a safety net, at least go back to where we were before. We will see more cases, and some of these people may be quite sick. It is, as I've said before, a marathon, not a sprint. Uh, and the desire to look at these relaxations and these alert levels as loopholes to race backwards into the past, a past that we probably won't see again for a year or two, is something that will cost us all uh, over the course of the, the long term. So again, uh, what we need to do is concentrate on the things Dr. Fitzgerald has emphasized individually, hand washing, good hygiene, uh, sneezing into, your, uh, uh, into the crook of your elbow, these kind of things. So again, keep your distance. And if you can't keep your distance, a non-medical or cloth mask will be your best protection for others, not necessarily for yourself. This, as you can see, is a communal effort, and without
without that communal effort, we're going to run into significant problems. We've seen second waves in other jurisdictions, some of which earlier on we touted in our presentation as places to, to look to for answers. Our plan for life with COVID-19 is a made in Newfoundland and Labrador solution, but it will take time. So with that, Premier, I, I'd hand it back to you uh, for the rest of the, uh, the event. Well, thank you, Minister. We now turn it over to the media for questions for today. Thank you, Premier. For the benefit of our speakers, we have six reporters registered for today's call. Each reporter will have the opportunity to ask two questions and one follow-up. We suggest that you not ask rumor-based questions. The purpose of these briefings is to address COVID-19 issues. All other government-related issues should be directed to the appropriate department or agency for response. Reporters will ask questions in the order they registered for today's call. I will call on each reporter by name to ask questions. Please do not press star 1 until your name has been called. Following this, should time permit, reporters will be individually asked a single question. This call will end at 2.59 p.m. and further questions can be submitted. Our first questions today are from Peter Jackson of The Telegraph. Please go ahead. Hi. Hi, Peter. Uh, I want to know, regarding uh, Level 4 that comes into effect on May 11th, whether it's only gardening centers and law and financial companies that can open, or what, is it possible that other businesses will qualify? Um, so if you uh, go to the website, there is a uh, list of businesses that will uh, be considered under uh, Level 4. And, uh, and there are others besides those, those two. Those were just uh, examples of low-risk businesses that uh, I gave yesterday. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, how, how is the government going to navigate the logjam of businesses all, all not wanting to know at once if they qualify at each alert level? Well, over the next week, uh, since this is, comes into effect, alert level four at Mar uh, May 11th, so we've, uh, un with an understanding that there would be a lot of uh, questions, you know, what, making the announcement yesterday through the chief medical officer, we've been able to set up uh, uh, some responses for business. I mentioned yesterday about the business guidance uh, group that would be available, and they are available to work with businesses that would be able to answer those questions about where w they would fit into alert level four over the next few days. Okay. Um, this has come up before, and uh, but it still seems to be an issue. Trade Denel now is calling for a stop to workers coming in from outside the province. And uh, apparently a lot of these workers are not bringing in uh, unique skills that are not available here. Why isn't the province implementing that, that a local worker policy regardless of it being an exemption or not. I'm just curious why the province wouldn't want to try to do that. Yeah, it is a good question. And, of course, we've said essential travel only. And so anyone that's coming into the province, uh, based on that being essential travelers, uh, there would be uh, those, r those rules apply. And, you know, it's, it's a place, uh, our province, for non-essential travel. That's how we've got it set up. I know I've heard examples, and I've reached out personally to some companies that have brought in people from the outside, even though they're very limited. I addressed some or gave out some of the uh, numbers that have been coming into our province in a general way, both essential and otherwise. And there's a limited number of people. I think the day before yesterday, the number was less than 150, and that would be people returning home from work from outside of Newfoundland and Labrador and essential travels. Uh, travelers, and that was at all points of entry for Newfoundland and Labrador. So the numbers are very limited. So right now it's essential travelers only, and they must make the case. And with the new rules uh, that apply, of course, you know, there's quarantine measures that are all that are there also. But it's essential travel only, and we'll continue to watch for those, you know, that are coming in from outside of the province, and we'll take the appropriate action. You know, we uh, if you can find the if you can find those workers there, well, it's necessary that you're able to do that. We should be able to do that. Thank you. Our next questions are from Peter Cowan of CBC News. Please go ahead. Peggy, you touched on this briefly, but there have been a lot of questions about uh, moving to a limit of 10 people per gathering. If people can maintain physical distance, uh, could, for example, neighbors get together to have a backyard fire or other small gatherings, looking at places like PEI, where they have allowed five people from different households as 
long as that physical distance is maintained. So I think we have to look at the feasibility of that happening. Um, and uh, my concern would be that, that, that while that might be the way things start out at the beginning of the gathering, it may not be how it ends up. Uh, we have uh, put a limit at 10, um, and that is for more organized uh, situations. So our, our intent was that if we had some of these ceremonies, uh, like funerals, um, perhaps weddings, things like that, where people would be in a building where physical distance could be maintained, um, that uh, that was the intention of uh, the gatherings. Uh, right now, we're still recommending that people stay within their bubble uh, and not uh, uh, not go outside of that. Uh, certainly, while you're within your bubble, you can you can have a backyard barbecue uh, with the people in your bubble, uh, and that would be okay. Speaking of bubbles, uh, some people who have RVs are a little bit upset that it's not until level two that they could actually go and spend uh, overnight in their RVs. If people are just moving their bubble from their home to their RV, they're not bursting anyone else's bubble, what's the concern? The concern with uh, campsites is that uh, there are a lot of communal um, areas within campsites, uh, and there are lots of uh, recreational activities that happen within a campsite, and when people go camping, uh, it's, it tends to be a more social gathering, um, and, and certainly the concern is that uh, there would be a um, gathering of people together. Uh, children often play together uh, that may not be in each other's bubbles, and, uh, and so the concern there is that uh, you would have contacts with people who you might not know, or, uh, and it would make things difficult for contact tracing as well. So uh, there are a lot of things to consider when you're looking at uh, when you're when you're looking at these things, and it's not just as simple as I can go and I can stay in my in my bubble. We have to look at the whole picture of what uh, what might be the ramifications of that. And my last question: When with the number of visitors that we're seeing right now fairly low, the premier went over those numbers earlier this week around 150 or so per day. Why aren't we testing all visitors who arrive? And uh, in the province for COVID-19? So when we're doing testing, a test is only as good as the reason you're doing it. So you need to make sure that the reason you're doing the test um, is to give you an answer that you need. And right now, uh, we have to look at what the risk is with, um, with regard to <coughs> doing testing of asymptomatic people, because people who are symptomatic shouldn't be traveling. So it would be mainly asymptomatic people. So we are doing some testing of asymptomatic people. We're asking uh, anyone who's going into a nursing home, a long-term care facility, or a personal care home, an assisted living facility, that they be tested before they go into those areas. We're testing asymptomatic people who are parts of outbreaks. We're testing asymptomatic people who are contacts of known cases. Uh, because we know that uh, these people are either at higher risk for having the disease even if they're asymptomatic or uh, if they were uh, asymptomatic and positive, there are uh, bigger ramifications with regard to causing an outbreak, for example, in a long-term care facility. Um, if we're testing everyone that's coming into the province, we have to do a lot of testing. Uh, the number that you need to test to find one positive is quite high. Uh, if you look at the level, the prevalence level, or the number of cases that are in our communities uh, at the moment, or what we anticipate is the number of people in our communities. So you would have to test a lot of people to find one positive, uh, and that uh, could, you know, potentially put a strain on testing supplies. It could put a strain on PPE supplies. All of these things are things you have to consider when you're talking about testing asymptomatic people. So it's not just as simple as doing the test and being able to get the result. There's a lot of things to consider there. And, uh, you know, we are asking people who are coming into the province to self-isolate for 14 days. If they were to become symptomatic, uh, we can certainly test them then. And uh, if, uh, but we have effectively removed them from the population and from spreading that. Uh, if they were to be positive, we re remove them from the population by asking them to isolate. So the risk of them spreading it to someone else is quite low. Uh, so you, you know, there's a whole lot of considerations to put into that. So at the moment, we won't be doing that. If evidence changes, if our epidemiology changes, then certainly, um, you know, we will look at that situation again. Thank you. 
Our next questions are from Patrick Butler of Radio Canada. Please go ahead. Dr. Patel, you said yesterday the delay for moving to Alert Level 4 would, would give businesses time to repair, but if there's still a little bit of lack of clarity on, on, on who um, you know, who is considered a, a low-risk business, or you're still coming up with, like, that, that full list. Um, does that hold water? I mean, why wouldn't you have more details ready uh, when this was announced yesterday? So we, you know, certainly from a determining a low-risk business, it's impossible for us to know every business that's out there and what their risk level is. Uh, we need people to engage with us to be able to make that determination and then to give them the advice that they would need to be able to uh, uh, open safely if indeed they were determined to be at low risk. Uh, and those mechanisms are in place. Um, and uh, uh, so hopefully people will be able to get the information that they need before we open. Uh, Premier, the, uh, the leadership race for your party has been put off once again. You said you wanted to to steer the ship while uh, Newfoundland Labrador continues with its pandemic response. Um, do you think that the race should be suspended indefinitely given we're still in a pandemic situation? Well, as I said so many times, my focus is really on this current health crisis and the economic crisis that we deal with. Uh, when they decide on who the next leader of the party is, that's the Liberal Party's decision, not mine. I have made it quite clear that I will not be seeking re-election. But I also made it quite clear that I will do use my experience during this health crisis, and then do whatever I can to support the province in the economic crisis. You know, you know clearly we're in a situation right now where we can't even give someone a, a proper funeral. We can't have people where people waiting for elective surgeries. There's so many things that were at one time normal in our province. That's my focus right now. It's on the well-being of Newfoundlanders and Labradorians not the future of the Liberal Party. Someone else will make that decision. Um, and, and another question about workers coming into the province. Uh, in New Brunswick, uh, uh, temporary foreign workers have been banned despite some, some pushback from people in the agriculture and uh, fishery sectors. Will Newfoundland Labrador be doing the same? Yeah, so that's the temporary foreign workers program I think you're talking about. They do have, and we all do as provinces, have people that come from outside the country to work uh, here in our province from time to time. Uh, they are spread throughout our province. Some of them are currently here working with the agriculture industry. Some more would come in, you know, typically around this time of the year to work in our uh, in fish uh, processing plants. And we have many skilled people that would come in under this program as well. So, you know, right now, if there's anyone in a, that's out of work looking for a job in those sectors, and of course, we want to employ Newfoundlanders and Labradorians, and from time to time, if we can't find that skill set here, well, the businesses will look to other means to be able to do that. But clearly right now, what we want to be able to is restrict as many people as coming into this province that are not, uh, that are not essential, and that will include, uh, you know, temporary foreign workers. Our next questions are from Kellyanne Roberts of NTV News. Please go ahead. Thank you. Um, Premier Ball, it's been noted by um, the opposition and by the NDP that they believe that the all-party committee for this may have run its course now and are suggesting an economic recovery committee instead. Your thoughts on this? Well, that, that's not the way I feel. I think we've had some real good uh, discussions on the public health all-party committee. And, you know, the idea there was when decisions were made, well, then, the, as they were made, of course, the justification for those decisions will be shared. And we've had great discussions, lots around testing, lots around travelers and so on. I think there's been some good information that has come out of there. So listening to some of the comments that were out yesterday, you know, clearly the economic recovery is a, is a, different, is a different situation. I'm, I would hope that all parties can get together to work on this together. Uh, but right now, it's uh, about four weeks ago, I did meet with the leader of the official opposition, Mr. Crosby, and leader of the third party, uh, Ms. Allison Coffin. This was four weeks ago. We were only two weeks into the pandemic at that time, asking this very question. Uh, Ms. Coffin seems to be willing to, you know, get involved in an all-party committee, and I've yet to hear back from the leader of the uh, of the official opposition, Mr. Crosby, on this. But listen, the Olive Branch is there. I think Newfoundlanders and Labradorians expect us to work together at, during this crisis time, if it's a health crisis or an economic crisis. 
you know, my job and focus right now is on the future of our province, and hopefully all the parties, all the MHAs can find a way to work together. Thank you. And I'm not sure who can answer this, but in terms of the double bubble and that being introduced yesterday, is there at any point or in any of the levels that we could see this expand where you could potentially add another bubble? Um, so we we didn't uh, specify that in the plan because obviously it will very much depend on what the uh, what our epidemiology is here. So what the the spread of of the disease looks like in Newfoundland and Labrador, uh, you know, we need to make sure that uh, we don't have uh, spread within our communities. We need to make sure that the the prevalence of the disease is low uh, before we can make any determinations like that. So uh, we felt it was better to uh, not make predictions about that and uh, to look at it as uh, time went on and as we had more information. Thank you. And my final question, um, in determining the primary residence for those that are coming in, um, I'm thinking of students, for example, that may travel to the province um, for school, say September. I know that seems like a ways out, but if we are to remain with these restrictions in place, how will you determine the primary residence? We, uh, Kellyanne, have a mechanism for doing that. It's actually laid out. Uh, there's some legalese around it, but it's essentially uh, uh, someone who is ordinarily resident in the province. It's the same criteria we would use, for example, for determining uh, MCP eligibility. The advantage of healthcare eligibility is that by interprovincial agreement, you can't have two cards that are valid at the same time. Uh, so uh, that may be the single fastest way of identifying if someone is a resident of this province, whether they have a valid MCP card. Obviously, there'll be a few people whose cards would have expired since the beginning of the COVID pandemic, and we have made arrangements for them. Uh, but uh, uh, it's people whose primary residence is Newfoundland and Labrador. Thank you. Our next questions are from Holly McKenzie Souter of the Canadian Press. Please go ahead. Okay, we'll move along to Tyler Dunn of the OCMP. Please go ahead. What do we know about the latest case of COVID-19 in the province? Um, so the latest case is a, a contact of a previously known case. Okay, thank you. And uh, pet daycares have been been given the go-ahead in phase four, but pet groomers are wondering why they haven't been allowed the same access. Uh, so pet daycares, uh, part of the reason um, that they were given the go-ahead is because as people go back to work, um, some people will end up uh, needing someone to look after their animals if they work extended shifts and things like that. Uh, so we felt that in some ways we had to open that up in, in level four as we opened up uh, um, work places. I guess just a follow up to that. They, they are saying that like some animal nails are kind of like growing into their paws and pets are getting unmatted and the contact between both the daycare and the grooming services are relatively similar. Uh, part of the concern about grooming is, uh, you know, would be how close employees have to get to be able to uh, groom animals and hold animals. Uh, certainly some of the concerns that we've heard, uh, we've been reassured uh, by uh, the veterinary uh, uh, group that uh, these uh, problems can be taken care of at a vet's office. Okay, thank you. So we have about 19 minutes left for questions. We're going to start again with Peter Jackson of the Telegram, and we'll give everybody two questions each. Go ahead, Peter. Hi. Hey, Peter. Uh, sorry. Uh, restaurants uh, are now able to uh, provide liquor with curbside pickup. How are they going to monitor for the legal aid for alcohol doing that? So there's uh, for the, if it's delivered, you know, my understanding there would be that uh, before there would have to be a proof of age and identification before the delivery is completed. So there's a mechanism that has been put in place to prevent those of uh, that are not of age uh, to purchase alcohol. Those provisions are put in place as safety measures, so we would not find ourselves in a situation where would we where there would be the delivery of alcohol to underaged uh, individuals. 
and and uh, I'm wondering uh, if it's possible, if you know, uh, Dr. Fitzgerald, what the longest case uh, in the ICU has been so far. I, I, I'm sorry, Peter, I don't have that information. And I'm not sure that we can release that if it, uh, uh, you know, that's a fairly um, private patient information. Okay, thank you. Our next question is from Peter Cowan of CBC News. Please go ahead. Looking at how long we're waiting between uh, step four and step three, uh, 28 days is one of the longest ones that we've seen. If you look across the country, Saskatchewan, for example, is usually two weeks before they wait down. Why are we going with a longer time frame here? So as I explained yesterday, um, the incubation period of this virus is, eight, is 14 days. Uh, sometimes it can take up to two weeks before uh, we see more severe cases or before we see people who test positive develop severe disease. So you may not see them in hospital until that time. So it can take a... Uh, um, an extended period of time for you to see what the effect of relaxing certain measures will have on the um, uh, incidence of this disease in the in the province, and so we're being uh, we're acting out of an abundance of caution uh, to look at uh, um, uh, how our measure how relaxing our measures uh, what effect they're going to have, uh, and that's why we used uh, the period of two incubate uh, the time of two incubation periods. Uh, to be able to do that, and that uh, is not out of keeping with uh, recommendations at the FPT level. Uh, Saskatchewan relaxed uh, some, um, when we look at Saskatchewan, they relaxed some uh, uh, measures very similar to what we have uh, recommended in level four, and then two weeks later relaxed some other measures that were similar to ours in level four. So um, I think it's just a, a different way of doing the same thing, um, but uh, We chose 28. We just felt that that was what was best for us. And a question for people who live within the province but then also have a summer home uh, out around the bay, for example. What's the current recommendations and how does that change as we move through the different levels? We're recommending that people try to vacation as close to home as possible. Um, you know, it's the thing you have to remember about going to a small place uh, is that uh, small places have uh, may have uh, different healthcare infrastructure, and you have to be concerned if you were to go there and become sick. Um, you know what impact are you going to have on that community? But also, if you have something and you bring it to a small community, you have to think about that as well, and how much you're going to be re interacting with people in that community. Um, so. Um, Whatever your plans are with regard to traveling to a summer home, I think the basic principles of physical distancing, uh, staying in your own bubble, um, that still would apply. But uh, you know, I would hope that people will uh, behave responsibly and and uh, try to make the best decisions. Thank you. Our next questions are from Patrick Butler of Radio Canada. Please go ahead. to make sure I understood your answer on, on temporary foreign workers. Are te temporary foreign workers allowed to come into this province uh, for work at this time, point in time? Well, in some cases, uh, temporary foreign workers can be deemed essential. So that's, as I mentioned, there, if there's a service and, or you can't find the skills within our province, in some cases that has to be filled. And this is a process that you have to go through. Uh, it, it must be an essential worker. So. Uh, temporary foreign workers are by federally. Uh, there's a federal program that's been put in place for temporary foreign workers. So not, that's not to say that all temporary foreign workers could, any temporary foreign workers could not come to Newfoundland and Labrador. Some would probably have to come here because they would be deemed essential. Okay. Uh, and, and a question is related to uh, uh, Airbnbs. Other provinces have, have uh, banned uh, Airbnb operation or Airbnbs from operating during the pandemic. Is that the case here as well? 
Um, as far as Airbnbs are still operating, and certainly in some instances, people were using uh, such um, uh, residences or places as uh, uh, a way to uh, quarantine themselves or to isolate themselves. Um, so uh, we certainly didn't want to take away that option from people, so uh, they have been operating. Thank you. Our next questions are from Kellyanne Roberts of NTV News. Please go ahead. Thank you. And looking at the alert levels, um, we don't specifically say much about contact tracing. Obviously, I assume that's going throughout this entire process no matter what. Where does the digital tracking fit into this, and are we still on track to have this potentially come to be in the next few weeks? Digital tracking, uh, Kellyanne, is uh, an adjunct to um, uh, regular uh, old-fashioned shoe leather tracking, as it were. The idea would be that uh, data would be uh, on individuals' phones, and only if and when they chose to release it would that then be used for, for contact tracing. And it would just uh, facilitate the program and make it uh, a lot more detailed. Uh, the issue around is, is it still on track, the short answer there uh, is yes. Uh, but it's, uh, it's not a substitute. Uh, it's, a, it's a help to uh, make the progress, uh, make the, um, the contact tracing progress process, sorry, um, process more efficient uh, and uh, more streamlined. So, Kellyanne, if I could, and if I could just ahead. for a, a few minutes here, just speak to this a little bit. I mean, I know I was, uh, I was on a call last night for over two hours with my you know, other premiers across the country. The prime minister was there. And it was quite a bit of attention that we uh, we had a great conversation about you know the plan that we had released. It was very different than what we would have seen from other jurisdictions across the country, just using the alert system as opposed to a, a point system and a or a phased in system. So keep in mind, you know, with the requirement for PPE, there's also a number of indicators. And as the minister just mentioned, you know, the public health officials have done a, a really good job, a very good job, in uh, in contact tracing. So the minister is right. This would be a complementary measure. Uh, contract or contact tracing is continuing with some very good people at public health. So it would be a nice to have, but not probably necessary to have. It's uh, it'll be a new application for people in our province. I would, you know, I would embrace it. I would look forward to it. But it's not something that we have to do. Thank you. And um, I know there's been some clarification on this in terms of parents who share custody of children and blended families when it comes to the bubble that the idea is to um, have one bubble become two, not two become four. What do you say to those that um, share custody and may have already joined a bubble and now they have a child that's also going from their home to another home? Um, Kelly, and we've had um, correspondence with Justice and Public Safety who have produced some recommendations around shared custody arrangements. Uh, one of the issues fundamentally is that these are court-ordered, court-sanctioned arrangements. Um, you know, we would then um, rely on the good judgment of the parents and the caregivers to interpret those arrangements in the light of a pandemic uh, and whatever level of bubble they might have. Uh, the idea of bubbles is uh, to provide people with options uh, where they feel it's safe. No one actually has to expand or double their bubble uh, this weekend simply because that's been allowed. But I think ultimately if there was ever an issue over a, a court order um, uh, custody arrangement, quite frankly, it would have to be down to a court to arbitrate as to who was right, who was wrong, and what the resolution should be. Thank you. Our next questions are from Tyler Dunn of VOCM News. Please go ahead. For the Premier. Trades and L is saying out-of-province construction workers have been granted exemption to enter the province to work on public infrastructure projects without self-isolating for 14 days. Can you touch on that? Yeah, so my understanding in these situations, if they were deemed essential, there would be uh, measures that would be put in place on the, on the workplace. You know, so we're following up on this question. I, we're familiar with it. So we have some people that are following up. First of all, to determine the number of people that have been impacted, why they're here, and what's happening on those workplaces when they're in our province. Uh, Tyler, the exemptions to the orders which are listed on the website are actually crystal clear. 
that when these individuals who are exempted for work purposes are not working, they must observe self-isolation. The exemption is only while they are traveling to and from their workplace and while they are at work. It is not a blanket. Okay, thanks for clarifying. Okay, we have a few minutes left. We're gonna take some single questions and I'll ask you to press star one and identify yourself, please. Peter Cowan, your line is now open. Thank you. Premier, I, I want to go back to the leadership question. You said you'd stay on as long as the pandemic is still an issue with some talk that this may be 18 months to two years. Does that mean that uh, you may stick around as Premier for that long? I'll stick around as you know, long as, you know, as, as, long as, as, need, as I'm needed. Uh, it's the party that will determine now that I've, since I've submitted my resignation, it's the party that would, would determine when the uh, leadership race would, the, the one that is now stalled, it's up to the Liberal Party of Newfoundland and Labrador that will determine when this, uh, when the leadership race begins again. They will reset it. But for me, I'm going to be here either as Premier of this province or as an MHA doing whatever I can to support this province. Uh, it, it's important right now, I think, that we have the experience given the state of emergency that's in place. Uh, you know, I, as I said so many times, my focus is uh, and will be, will continue to be on Newfoundlanders and Labradorians the future of the Liberal Party and its next leader, that will be determined by someone else. Next question. Peter Jackson, your line is now open. Hi. Um, the, uh, as, as businesses open, people start going back to work, we're looking at more and more daycare operators open. Are you going to run into the same sorts of problems you did there, uh, convincing them to open for essential workers? So what was that question again, Peter? The uh, daycare operators uh, who were reluctant initially to open for essential workers, you're now going to want more of them. Are you expecting that to go smoothly? Well, first of all, I want to say that we have a, uh, a large group of you know, real good daycare operators and, and uh, early childhood educators that supply services in our, in, in our province. We also have some you know, positions that people actually uh, – use daycare operations within their home. So both uh, a lot of them are regulated as well, as I said, as daycare operators. So they've been providing a real good service to our essential workers during the early stages of this pandemic. And of course, as we continue to relax some of the measures that have been put in place by the chief medical officer, it will mean that more people would go back to work. Therefore, it would mean that we would need childcare spaces open up to support those uh, those businesses and organizations that will requ that will require workers. It's, we all know that those workers would require daycare services for their children. So it's important then that they uh, uh, that we uh, as we open up businesses, we must open up you know some um, daycare centers as well, just to be able to provide that service. We've never, by the way, we've never stopped paying the grants and and uh, uh, compensation to our daycare operators. They've been paid as if they've been full throughout this whole process. Thank you. Next question, please. Katie Ann Roberts, your line is now open. Thank you. As we go into level four or, or look two, um, we know it's been discussed about fishing, hunting, and golfing being some of those recreational activities we might be able to do, but they'll be done in a different way than previous. Does this mean that I can only golf with those in my bubble? So with regard to golfing, that would be ideal um, if you were able to do that. Uh, certainly, uh, it, physical distancing is much um, much easier on a golf course, I think. Uh, you know, it's uh, wide open and uh, people can easily stay more than six feet apart. And we know that the risk of transmission is lower while outside as opposed to inside. Um, so uh, we do think that uh, golfing can be done successfully. Um, so it wouldn't necessarily have to be someone in your bubble, but that would be the ideal situation. Certainly, uh, I think um, we'll have to um, have discussions about how, how to best do that, or the, you know, um, people in the golfing um, industry will have to um, talk about that and uh, try to decide what's the safest and best way to do that. But um, 
it does seem to be something that is quite doable. Well, I think for me, as, as someone who, uh, not so much of a golfer or someone that likes to spend some time on a, a salmon river from time to time, I think there's areas that you know, we just use common sense in all of this. We protect one another. We protect other people uh, you know, from us as this. But there, there are certain things that you could actually do with using common sense and put in place guidelines that you can actually do uh, and you can be successful at it, as the Chief Medical Officer has just said. If you find yourself on the Salmon River, you, well, you are literally a long ways away, and it's a safe way, but it's also a way to protect yourself from COVID-19. Uh, no different than on a, on a golf course, and there will probably be hiking trails, you know, uh, walking, running, and, you know, bicycling and so on. So there's all kinds of things that we were able to do to get people out and get them active again. But first and foremost, use common sense, protect each other, and if you are in a situation where physical distancing is cannot be practiced safely, well, you just wear a mask. And so it's we put the rules in place, and you know, trying to you know get some people out out there, get them a little more in, in, engaged and involved, realizing that this virus is going to be around our community for a long time yet. But it really comes down to common sense, making sure you live within the guidelines that have been put in place. Thank you. We have time for one quick question. Please press star one. There are no further questions. Thank you very much. The time for questions has ended. We thank you for tuning in. We'll be back again on Monday at 2 p.m., 1.30 in Moulton, Labrador. So have a great weekend, everyone, and stay safe in your bubbles.